Good afternoon. I want to welcome you to today's event. Um, I'm Amber Harris Bozer, a faculty research fellow. And on behalf of the Office of Research and Innovation, I want to welcome everybody to today's event. Um, not just those of you that are in this classroom, but those of you that are watching on a live stream at our student watch party in 221, and the 18 of you that are um, watching from outreach campuses. So thank you so much. And you may be wondering why you can't hear me. There's no speaker in this room. This is for the live stream. So don't be worried that the mic isn't on. Before we get started, there's a couple people that we want to thank for today's event. Um, we want to thank um, David Betts and Joey McReynolds for making the live stream possible for our outreach locations. We want to thank the other faculty research fellows, um, Kartik Venkatraman in the back over there um, from engineering and Dr. Brandon Smith from animal sciences, as well as Dr. Thomas Falkenberry from psychological sciences, our former research fellow. We want to thank Dr. Murray and Dr. Hurley for their support for research initiatives on campus, um, as well as our Office of Research and Innovation staff, Ms. Linda Sanders, Lacey Harris, and Annie Lenore for their contributions to these events. Um, thank you so much. Um, we want to thank Dr. Leslie Leach, the Associate Dean of Research, and Dr. Barry Lambert, our AVP of Research. They couldn't be with us today because they have prior commitments that are off campus, but they send you their warm regards for the day. Um, one of our primary missions in the Office of Research and Innovation is to facilitate collaborative discussions about research on campus. And when we sat down last year to talk about the kinds of events that we wanted to plan for this year, we really wanted to do something special to highlight the extraordinary research that's going on on campus. And so the Community of Scholars Colloquium was formed. So far, we've heard from two of our colleagues, one from the College of Business um, and one from Medical Lab Sciences. And today, we're going to hear from Dr. Christina Higgins. But the goal is to, like I said, highlight research on campus and to enhance um, the profile of research um, here at Tarleton. Um, Dr. Higgins graduated from the University of Texas in Austin in 2008. She's got a PhD in Human Development and Family Sciences. She's a certified family life educator. Um, she's very passionate about making sure that young children are set up for success in life, not just through education of teachers, but through education of parents. And she's really passionate about um, early numeracy in the home. Before joining the faculty at Tarleton, she worked as a research associate for years at the Answers Institute at Texas Christian University. She served as an adjunct at TCU, at UT Austin, at Loyola University Chicago, and she's got over a dozen years of experience um, in the early childhood education classroom. She has published 13 peer-reviewed publications, um, one book chapter, has presented at over three dozen research conferences, and she was recently awarded the Scholarship Award from the College of Education. Um, so please help uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Christina Higgins. Thank you everybody for being here and thank you Amber for that lovely introduction. Today I'm going to talk to you about two things that we can all relate to. The first thing that I'm going to talk to you about is children and more specifically parenting young children. Now we were all parented by someone and probably multiple someones who influenced the way we see the world. And whether you're a parent, a future parent, a grandparent, uh, you might be an aunt or uncle or older sibling, but you know we all have an impact on children in our lives, or you may have an impact on children in your future career. The second thing that I'm gonna talk to you today about, and this is not everybody's favorite topic of conversation, but it's math. Now we all use math in our daily lives, whether it's through personal finance or doing your taxes, it's that time of year. Um, if you, you go to the store and you buy things or you're selling things. Um, we use it throughout our daily lives. You may not use algebra and calculus every day, but we all know that math is foundational to being able to function in our society. And we lay those foundational skills in the preschool years. Now, I was lucky because I was raised in a home where math was spoken as a language in my daily life. So early on, we cooked. We, I learned how to tell time. I learned how to count money, um, things about geometry and shapes. And later, um, as I got older, I was taught algebra and calculus by my grandfather. He was a math professor. I was taught um, things about accounting and finances by my dad. 
I was taught about statistics by my mom, who was in college most of my life. And she was a psychology major, so she took a couple statistics classes. And through all of that, I learned about these concepts before ever being introduced to them in the school system. I would even go to my grandparents' house and take math quizzes for fun. I didn't know until I was an adult that that was weird. <laughs> I was lucky, but many children do not have this language of math in their home. So, you know, most parents do things like they read to their kids. They teach them their letters and sounds. They may teach them about history or their community or science. But a piece is missing, and that piece relates to the language of math. Now, when I started this study, I was out recruiting families to be a part of this, and I had a parent come up to me and say, wait a minute, her son was three. I know I'm supposed to read to him and stuff, but I'm really supposed to be doing math too? Now, I happen to know that this parent has an MBA and runs a successful business. She uses math every day for her career, and she's built a su successful career doing it. But she didn't realize she had the tools to impart that knowledge onto her children. And, you know, she, m most parents don't. Most parents assume the school system is going to take care of it. So when I started working at the Answers Institute, which stands for Alice Neely Special Education Research and Service Institute um, at TCU, I joined a team of researchers that were focused on math in the uh, elementary years. So we worked with second to sixth graders who, for some reason, had fallen behind in math. They may or may not have a learning difficulty or disability, but for some reason, they were behind. And so we were trying to figure out why they were behind and bring them up to speed so that they were on par with their peers. And what we found was a lot of them lacked foundational concepts. So for the younger students, this might look like something like being able to count to 10, but not understanding that that really represents 10 objects. For older students, they really lacked knowledge about fractions and decimals. They didn't understand a fraction was a part of a whole. They, if you asked them what a fraction was, they'd say a top number and a bottom number with a line in the middle. And so, we developed interventions that specifically tried to build these foundational concepts that would set them up for success when they got to algebra and to harder math later on. Because without those foundational skills, they can't move forward. When I came to Tarleton in 2015, I met Dr. Cheryl Mixon, who had her research to date had focused on math in the early years. And so we quickly realized we had something in common and started trying to come up with a research project that we could do that could really help lay these foundational concepts somehow. And through searching the literature, we found that there were a lot of interventions in the elementary years, starting from kindergarten on up. The ones in the early years were kind of few and far between and had mostly been done in the classroom and mostly been done um, on a short-term basis. You know, there were a couple of weeks kind of interventions. So, you know, as we're mulling this over, I happened to attend a conference in the spring of 2016 where in a session on early numeracy, I heard a statistic that really stuck with me and really drove our research in a different direction. And it was that one in four adults and one in four parents specifically have math anxiety. They don't like talking about numbers. So that means their homes are devoid of this language of math. And I'm sure many more, especially given the conversation with the parent that I re referenced previously, who, even though she has the language of math, wasn't necessarily using it in her home either. So we decided we were gonna do a home numeracy intervention and an intensive, intensive one. So the, we grounded our intervention in um, Lev Vygotsky's theory of social cultural development. For those of you who don't know what that is or what that means, um, Lev Vygotsky postulates that everyone learns from someone through interaction with someone who has more knowledge than they do, whether it's a parent, a peer, a teacher. Um, the idea is somebody has more knowledge than they do and they can scaffold that knowledge in the person who's learning. And so for us, we wanted the parents to scaffold that knowledge for their children in the home. That was our goal. So the intervention we designed, um, or the study we designed, is considered a single group pretest intervention protest, protest design. 
So our, um, we, our test included things like a measure of what people are already doing in the home with their kids, a measure of what they expect their children to know by the end of kindergarten, and a measure of what the children's mathematical understanding is, and it accounted for their maturity level because these are very young children. Um, so we recruited 40 families over three years to complete this intervention at two different preschools. And of those, um, the kids in the intervention, 23 of them were boys and 17 were girls, so we had a pretty good split. Um, the kids were all pre-kindergarten, so they were all between the ages of three and five when the study started, with the, the average age right at four. And they were predominantly Caucasian and predominantly middle class. The little variation in both, but the, that was basically our sample right there. And so we designed 15 activities to go home weekly with each of these families. And the activities included new concepts related to numbers and ops, op, numbers and op, I can't talk right now, <laughs> um, operations related to geometry, both two and three dimensional shapes. Um, related to measurement and data analysis, and related to things like classification and patterning and sorting, which are pre-algebraic skills. They lay the foundation for understanding algebra later. Each of these activities came with a set of instructions. They came with an easier version, a challenging version, and then an at-home version that the parents could continue doing once they had to give the materials back to us. And uh, one of the most popular activities was called Let's Move. So an example of an activity would be, um, they would draw a card from a deck of cards. It could say, clap your hands or do jumping jacks or something like that. They would roll two dice, add them together, and then do the number that's on the card. I had a parent write in the comment section of the form they filled out each week, I'm making my own one of these. We worked on reading comprehension and letter recognition along with adding to you know, the bit smaller number to the bigger number instead of starting at zero, and the whole family had fun playing. Now, not all the activities were that popular. Some of them the children loved, especially ones related to manipulatives like little counting bears or vehicles, but the parents said the children just wanted to play with the toys. They didn't want to do the activity. They're kids. <laughs> um, but by and large, the intervention was successful. So we found that Parent, what parents were currently doing in the home um, increased over the course of the intervention, especially related to um, counting and um, addition and subtraction. We found that um, what parents expected their children to master by the end of kindergarten greatly improved. Now they think they can add and subtract a 20, and they thought that they could um, count in sets of two fives and 10, whereas prior to that, the numbers were much lower. And they also, and oh, a great um, quote from a dad who stopped me in the hallway. He, he was excited that his four-year-old, he said, I had no idea she could add. So, you know, he was very excited about this. And then we also found that children's mathematical understanding improved over and above their maturation level. So they, you know, they're, the theory that introducing this language of math into the home in the early years can actually help improve children's mathematical understanding. Um, has now some validity to it. So while this is great for our 40 families, and you know, I, as I present this at conferences and workshops, I have educators and academics who are really you know, hanging on to this information. Um, the question remains, how do we get this into the hands of lots of parents and lots of families. So my next step is to create an activity book that's all inclusive. Instead of having materials out here, there, and everywhere, it'll all be in one place, and the parents can take that home and use that. And as a researcher, I want to study it on a large scale um, with a much more diverse population than we had before. Um, with the ultimate goal of getting the language of math into as many homes as possible. Right. Thank you.
awesome research with us. We want to thank you all again for coming today, and we have quite a bit of popcorn and hot chocolate and coffee left over. So if you'd like to stay in our student watch party in 221, come on down, have a little bit of informal conversation about research with us. Um, we hope to see you all again at our next event on March 5th in this room at 4 o'clock. Our next speaker is going to be Dr. T. Wayne Schwartner, who's going to talk to us about the role of research in biodiversity and nature conservation. Thank you so much.